Our message this morning, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. A.C. Dixon, a fine expositor of the Word of God, said, when we depend upon organization, we get what organization can do. When we depend upon education, we get what education can do. When we depend on money, we get what money can do. When we depend on singing and preaching, we get what singing and preaching can do. But then he said, when we depend upon prayer, we get what God can do. And oh, what this world needs is what God can do. What our cities need is what God can do. What your home needs is what God can do. What our churches need is what God can do. Amen? I'm indebted to Sue Drebert, who shared those thoughts with me on Monday morning. The morning after the deadliest mass shooting in modern U.S. history. I needed that reminder that day, and so do you. What we need now, desperately, is what God can do. We need something from heaven. The solutions that we seek are not coming from earth. Okay? Let me repeat that. All the king's horses and all the king's men are not putting Humpty Dumpty together again. We need something from heaven. Amen? As Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we're not talking about earthly love, but agape love. The love of God. Love that is patient. Love that is kind. Love that does not envy. Love that does not boast. That is not proud. Love that does not dishonor others, that is not self-seeking, that is not easily angered, that keeps no record of wrong. Love that does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love that always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love that never fails. Only that love from heaven can help us now. Amen. Amen. Folks, we need what only God can do. It is the reason we pray. It's the reason we believe. It's the reason we preach from this word and hold the type of meetings like the ones we're having that we started this week. It's because God has something for our nothing that means everything. And that something is eternal life in Jesus Christ and the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, last week, we took a brief pause for our creation seminar. We pick up this week and conclude this short three-part mini-series inspired by the book by retired pastor Helmut Haubeil, retired German pastor. This is the English translation of his book entitled Steps to Personal Revival. And I hope you took advantage of the free download and have been enjoying it. If not, I put on the screen for you again where you can get this book. Where you can get this book. In the first week, we looked at Luke chapter 11, if you remember that, and learned that the something for our nothing that means everything is obtained through persistent, constant asking. Ask, believe, claim. That's how you and I make withdrawals from the bank of heaven. And in assets, trillions doesn't do it justice. Not even a duodecillion, which is 10 to the 39th power. Not even a centillion, which is 10 followed by 309 zeros. Not even that can touch the worth and the value of heaven's assets. And those assets are every spiritual blessing in Christ. Nothing can touch the value and the worth of every spiritual blessing in Christ. I saw a lady in line at Safeway on Sunday buying a lottery ticket. She was hoping to win it big. 
I'm thinking to myself as I'm standing behind her, I've already hit the jackpot because in Christ I've got everything I need. Amen? But you know why most lottery winners lose all their millions within just a few years? It's that they don't replenish what they spend. Right? It all goes out and nothing is coming in. You see... Though you and I have hit the spiritual jackpot with the Holy Spirit, we have to replenish the supply every day. Remember this quote, morning by morning, he, Jesus, communicated with his Father in heaven, receiving from him what? Daily, a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is an overlooked but essential requirement for the baptism. You must receive it Daily. By the way, in your um, bulletins, you have a, a, a handout by which you can take notes. So I encourage you to look that up and take notes if you like. Sometimes we overlook this. You must receive the baptism daily. Why? 2 Corinthians 4.16, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed. How often? Day by day. It is a daily experience. Lee. Lee gets to renew this experience of her baptism, water and spirit, every single day. Imagine what life would be like, right, if every morning when you woke up there was a little baptistry in your room. And every morning before you left the house... In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be faithful unto death. I'll give you a crown of life. And every morning you went down in the waters and then came up new. How would that change your day? How would that set the course of your thinking, your mind, your attitude for the remainder of the day? And what, and what if at noontime that little baptistry was portable and you took it around you and after you've had a few hours on the workplace... You went down again and were baptized, okay? And then by the time you got home at the end of your day, shot in traffic. Man, you've got a little portable baptistry right there. Somebody cut you off in traffic. I'm baptized again in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? It would transform your life. It would change the way you think, your attitude, and the way you look. Well, that's what we do every time we receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost. He replenishes what we lose, because as we remember last week, we are leaky vessels. We leak. In part two of our series, we revisited the Valley of Dry Bones and there learned three additional lessons about revival and the baptism of the Spirit. Number one, we learned that revival takes time. You, there's a process involved. You, ha- you can't have Pentecost without Calvary. If you bypass the cross where Jesus says deny yourself, then you'll only have the appearance of revival. You'll have the glitz, but none of the glory. Revival takes time. Number two, don't stop praying too soon. Remember, when the bones came together, bone to his bone, and they stood up on their feet, they had flesh on them, there was still no life. There was still no life. If Ezekiel had stopped praying right then, the miracle wouldn't have been complete. But he had to pray again to the Spirit to come into those bodies. And then they came to life, right, and stood on their feet. So when you're praying for someone who is spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, and it doesn't look as if anything is happening, it looks as if it's to no avail, keep praying. Pray to the Spirit, pray to the breath, and ask that His Spirit enters them and brings them to life. Little Chloe was listening to my sermon on that day and wondered why I didn't show on the screen a picture of those dry bones once they came to life. She was concerned about that. And I had to explain to her, I said, honey, I looked for a suitable picture of those dry bones coming to life. And most people missed the whole point. All they had were skeletons standing on their feet. But that wasn't the miracle. It was living, breathing human beings. And so we are the living demonstration of dry bones that have come to life. Amen? Don't stop praying too soon. Number three, revival brings unity. The bones in the vision came together, bone to his bone. No longer separation and division. They came together. Jesus' final prayer in John chapter 17, verse 21 was that we might be one as he and the Father are one. 
that the world, he said, may believe. And my friends, if you and I, even in the family of God, can come together in unity, it will be a miracle and it will testify that Jesus is alive. Because only Jesus can bring about unity among human beings. We look at the carnage in Las Vegas this week. Man's inhumanity to man, and we ask the question, can these bones live? Yes, they can, if they receive something from heaven. Yes, these bones can live because God shows up in the unlikeliest places. And God was there in Las Vegas. God was there. Preserving life in the heroism of first responders and ordinary men and women who put themselves in harm's way to save a stranger, to save a spouse, a parent, or a friend. Yes, these bones can live because God shows up in the unlikeliest places. And that brings us to our final chapter today. You would think that after dry bones come to life and become a mighty end time army, that the story would be over. But are they just supposed to stand there? No. Having been raised by the Spirit, God's resurrected saints must walk in the Spirit. And this is the glorious result of spirit baptism. Walking in the power of the resurrection is the key to breaking the power of sin in our lives. Now this is dynamic, folks. This is powerful. We're going to um, unpack this in just a moment. But I want you to remember this. this is key. Walking in the power of the resurrection, of the new life of Jesus. It is resurrection power that fills us when we accept Jesus Christ by faith and ask for his spirit to infill us. It is resurrection power. It is the key, walking in that power, is the key to breaking the power of sin in our lives. How to walk in the spirit. And this thought was influenced by chapter 5 in that book, Steps to Personal Revival. So, we start with some of the basic steps. Before you start walking you got to put your shoes on. Simple. Shoes provide protection for your feet. They provide stability for your stance and balance. These are needed to trust the Father with his promise to give you the Spirit. Therefore, the shoes that you need this morning are praying the promises. Praying the promises of God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15 for starters. Now, this is the what? Confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he? He hears us. Talking about confidence that we have. God gives us a general promise that he answers prayers that are according to his will. God's will is expressed in both commandments and promises. God doesn't, listen, he doesn't command us to do anything without a promise to accomplish it. He doesn't command us to do anything without a promise to accomplish it. And so let's check that out. Here's the command from Ephesians chapter 5, 18. The command is be filled with the Spirit. And the Greek there is the active continual voice. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time event, Lee. You keep on being filled. It's a continual action. That's the command. So let's follow that with the promise. Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask him. How much more? There's the promise. We, this morning, may stand on the promises in our prayers. And then, back to 1 John, verse 15 goes on to say this. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know 
that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Notice the confidence expressed in the we know statements. There are two of them. We know that he hears us, and we know that we have what we asked for. My friends, that's protection, stability, and balance. Listen to this from Ellen White, the Southern Watchman, June 4, 1903. As with earnestness and assurance you come to God, tell him all about your necessities. Claim his promises. He has given us the privilege of coming to him, and we need have no fears of wearying him. Do not doubt his word of promise. Study the word, and with your Bible in hand, with your Bible in hand, say, Here, Lord, I come to receive the gift thou hast promised me. Say that last phrase with me. Here, Lord, I come to receive the gift thou hast promised me. That's how you put your spiritual shoes on every morning. So you can walk in the Spirit. You present to God His own word. And with the Bible in hand, say, Lord, I'm coming simply to claim what you promised I could have. Amen? It's how you pray the promises. You put on your shoes. What's the next step after you put on your shoes to walk in the Spirit? Well, tie the laces. Okay? You're praying the promises. You've got the shoes on. Now, don't let them fall off your feet. How do we tie the laces? Believe that you have what? Received. Believe that you have received. Mark chapter 11, verse 24, talking about the keys now to walking in the Spirit. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, what does it say? Believe that you receive them and you will have them. This verse right here, Ellen White commenting on Mark eleven twenty four, 24, calls this the divine science in prayer to believe that you have received. Listen to this from Book Education, page 257. Prayer and faith are closely allied and they need to be studied together. In the prayer of faith, there is a divine science. It is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. He makes it plain that our asking must be according to God's will. We must ask for the things that he has promised and whatever we receive must be used in doing his will. The conditions met the promise is unequivocal. The conditions met, the promise is unequivocal. There is no doubt that it will be fulfilled. Amen? That's praying the promises, praying with confidence and believing that you have received the thing that you asked for. But, you say, I can hear your thoughts. What if you don't feel like anything has changed? You pray for the daily baptism. You pray the promises and believe, but no fireworks. We're waiting to feel like Clark Kent coming out of the phone booth and be Superman, right? But it doesn't happen. You don't feel like anything has happened. What do you do then? Remember this, another important key in walking with the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit by faith and not by sight. You walk by faith, not by sight. Walking in the power of our feelings results in being controlled, listen, results in being controlled by unholy spirits. How many of you have heard the name Roger Morneau? Roger Morneau, all right? Roger Morneau, before he was converted to Christianity, was a spiritualist. He was in the occult and knew the unholy spirits quite well. After his amazing conversion, he wrote numbers of books on prayer, incredible answers to prayer, more incredible answers to prayer. Roger Mornola lived a godly uh, life of intercession and saw miracles take place before his death. But I wanted you to hear this statement from Roger about 
following your feelings. Listen to what he said. The spirits, talking about demons, would encourage people to listen to their what? Instead of the word of Christ and his prophets. In no surer way could the spirits obtain control of people's lives without the individuals realizing what was happening. They didn't even know what was happening because they were relying on feeling instead of faith. Praying with promises opens God's treasury for us. Our our loving Heavenly Father opens an inexhaustible account for us. Desire of Ages, page 668. They, the disciples, may expect large things if they have faith in His promises. Listen, feelings follow faith, not the other way around. You exercise faith in God's word and believe regardless of what you feel. And as you walk in the spirit and walk in the belief of that word, the feelings catch up. And so you can be walking in the Spirit, not really feeling like anything special has happened, and then slowly but surely you begin to notice a change in your demeanor, that you don't get angry at the same things you used to get angry at, that your tongue is not quite so quick and so sharp as it used to be, that you don't have as much pride and self-protection as you once did. And you begin to see those graces of the Holy Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the the, the faithfulness, the meekness, and self-control start to slowly but surely enter into your life. You may not even perceive what's going on until somebody else says, hey, what's, what's changed? Something's different about you. You didn't feel any fireworks, but little by little, because you believed in the Word of God, He made it so, and you received, and the feelings catch up later. You receive the gift of the Spirit through thankfulness. Helmut Heibel says, our thanks at this moment expresses our trust in God, that he has answered our prayer, and that we expect it to be fulfilled when we need it most. To walk in the Spirit requires a renewed mind, a mind that has received something from heaven. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. In the divine science of prayer, listen, thanking regardless of feeling activates believing and receiving. That's the key. That's the key to activating your belief and your ability to receive a gift. Someone gives you something, and what do you say? Thank you. Thank you seals the deal. It brings the transfer of ownership from the person who's giving to the person receiving. And you say, thank you. You take possession. It becomes yours. That's what actuates the believing and receiving. Thanksgiving. You know you have begun walking in the Spirit when you can pray, thank you, God, that you answered my prayer. Thank you for already granting my request. Thank you that I will experience it at the time I need it most. Amen? Now, some people could say this is just self-manipulation. You're fooling yourself. You're talking yourself into something. Listen again to what Habel writes. He says, with self-manipulation... I'm trying to persuade myself. When I have prayed with a promise, then I have a divine basis for my changed thinking because I have already been answered through faith. In this case, if I don't change my thinking, then I'm showing God I don't trust him, but rather I'm feeling-oriented. With this behavior, I'm making God a liar and will thus not receive anything. The word of caution to us is do not make God into a liar by doubting his promises. Do not make God into a liar by doubting his promises. Some of you will say, well, it's not God's promises I doubt. It's me that I doubt. 
I doubt my worthiness to receive his spirit. I'm too sinful. I'm not fulfilling all the requirements. Well, let me ask you this question. Are you greater than God? Then why are you trusting in your sinfulness more than in God's righteousness? Yes, you're human. Yes, you're weak. And you mess up. Big surprise to God. That we sinful human beings mess up. That's no surprise to him. He knows what you're made of, and that's why he wants to give you what he's made of. The Holy Spirit of God is precisely why you and I need something from heaven. He wants to give you a part of himself. That's how we become partakers of what? The divine nature. And here's the most wonderful and explosive thing about walking in the Spirit. This is the crux of it, okay? And it comes from our scripture reading this morning, Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the Spirit. Do you see the promise contained in the command? I say then, walk in the Spirit. That's the command. What's the promise? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We read it as a command. You shall not. Thou shalt not. No, no, no. He's saying that's going to be the result of your walking in the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. (laughs) That's the promise. The two things can't abide together. It's like losing weight. You won't lose one ounce by sitting and wishing the weight away. You've got to move. That's right. We talked about that in our health nugget just last night. You've got to walk. There's no victory in sitting in the spirit. You notice that? It doesn't say sit in the spirit. And you know recent studies have shown that sitting down is as bad as what? Smoking. Sitting is just as bad as smoking. So many people right now are using stand-up desks because they realize they're sitting for hours at a time, crushing their organs, and it is as bad as being a smoker, okay? So they're getting stand-up desks. In fact, this week I was online looking for a stand-up desk because I recognize my middle is telling me I need one, okay? And I was thinking about that. Maybe churches would be better off with stand-up pews, You lose the weight of sin by walking in the Spirit, asking, believing, receiving, thanking, and following the Lamb wherever He goes. Could it be that our daily defeats with habits, sin, and even the past that dogs our steps and invades the joy that should be in the present moment with Christ? Could it be because we are wearing the wrong shoes, shoes that are ill-fitting, fighting in our own strength and not walking in the Spirit? This is a promise expressed as a command. Remember, God doesn't give us a command without a promise to fulfill it. He shows us here that when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, that we aren't at the mercy of our lusts anymore. The Holy Spirit breaks the power of sin in us. You can read this in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, but especially verse 2. Through the Holy Ghost, the deeds of our body, verse 13, are put to death. Being filled with the Spirit is the something from heaven. Where did I go? That's the wrong wrong slide. Here we go. Being filled with the Spirit prevents you from being filled with the flesh. It just makes sense. If you're full of one thing, you can't have room for something else. Being filled with the Spirit prevents you from being filled with flesh. But, watch, there's a caveat. But what you fill up with first determines the course of your walk. What you fill up with first will determine the course of your walk for the day. So if I don't fill up with the Spirit first thing, the course of my steps for the day has already been set. And it may not be with the Spirit, right? 
My attitude may be wrong, and I may be quick-tempered. I may say some things on the freeway that I shouldn't say. Okay? But if you fill up with the Spirit first, and that's why, right? If we fill up with the Spirit first, that's why Jesus says, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things, right, will be given to you as well. Which is another promise to pray and to receive with thanksgiving. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is the key to a life of faith in joy, power, love, and victory over sin. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, the Bible says there is liberty. There is freedom. I want to leave you tonight as we close not only this service, but this series on being filled with the Holy Spirit with a sample prayer for the Holy Ghost with promises. It's included in the book, Personal Steps to Personal Revival, but I reproduced it for you. So you can leave here with it today. It's on the back side of your um, sermon notes. And you may keep this. Keep it in your Bible. Keep it with you. You can pray it on a daily basis. It's not word for word. It's not that the prayer itself is magic. But it's a sample of how you can pray the promises. And I want us to leave and close our service today with this prayer together. So I'm going to put it on the screen. But. I want everyone to stand up because you can't pray this prayer sitting down. You can't pray this prayer sitting down. We are going to walk in the Spirit today. So, together from the screen, let's read the prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus our Savior. You said, give me your heart. I want to do that now by submitting myself to you today with everything I am and have. Thank you that you have already answered this prayer according to your will. Because your word says that if we pray according to your will, we know that we have already received it. And you also said that you would by no means cast anyone out who comes to you. Jesus said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You further said that you would give the Holy Ghost to those who believe in you who obey you, who let themselves be renewed with the Holy Spirit, and who walk in the Spirit. This is my desire. Please accomplish this in me. For this reason, I sincerely ask you, Father, to give me the Holy Ghost today. Since it is a request according to your will, I thank you that you have given me the Holy Ghost now. Thank you that I have received your divine love at the same time because your word says the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I want to say with the psalmist, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Thank you that I can love my fellow human beings with your love. Thank you that through the Holy Ghost, the power of sin has been broken in me. Please save and protect me today from sin and from the world. Give me protection from the fallen angels. Save me from temptations. And when necessary, snatch me. Oops, and I went too far. <laughs> Thank you. Snatch me and save me from my old corrupt nature. And please help me to be your witness in word and deed. I praise you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Do you receive it today? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we do thank you. And we receive the blessing of of the infilling and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Make us new. May we never be the same again. May we continue continually to walk 
in your spirit, in victory over sin. In Jesus' name, amen.